My name is Stanislaw Robert Liberta with AV Ultra, and today we're going to put together a little intro that looks like this. So I have these picture frames in space, and I've got this camera moving around the space, flipping around, and I've used behaviors to animate the camera. I also have a bit of a blur around the edges and some emitters there. If you go ahead and open up lesson 12B start, let's jump into this. When I first open this lesson, you're gonna notice a few different things. We have a background plane, we have a main drop zone, and we also have some flare and sparkles. If I open up this flare and sparkles, by the way, if you're curious about this, I just have a lens flare and I have an emitter in here that I added a bit of a mask to in the center. And if I change this to my perspective, you can see I just have a single drop zone in 3D and I have my background plane in 2D. My background plane is just made up of a single gradient. And the reason why I have that in 2D is because when my camera is focused on it, I don't want it changing. So I don't want to be seeing the edges of that. If I made that into a 3D layer, I would hit the wall of that and you would see it flipping around in space. And that's not what I want. Okay, so let's go ahead and start putting these things together. From the very beginning, you'll notice that I put together this picture frame and it's just a series of different elements in here. So I have a single drop zone and then I have an outer frame and an inner frame. And if I turn these on and off, you can see kind of how that's built up. I'm also gonna go ahead and turn off my flare and sparkles just for right now so it's not distracting. And so I have my single drop zone and what we're going to do is we're going to copy this frame one. So if I hit Command D on my keyboard, now I have a second frame. I'm gonna rename this right away. I'm gonna call this frame two. I'm gonna to continue to do that five more times. Now that I've positioned my items here in X and Y space, I'm actually going to take my camera and zoom out. And you'll notice that my images are disappearing. And if you'll remember, that is because of my camera's far plane. So I'm actually just going to boost that up and there are my different picture frames. So now that I have this positioned in X and Y space, I actually want to create a little bit of depth between them as well. So if I go up to my views and I'm just going to put on two different views and we're going to change this one here to a top view and we'll just fit that. And what I want to do is I'm going to take any of these and turn on my 3D gizmo and just push them further and closer in space. So if I go to my frame seven, we'll just bring this up a bit closer. Frame six, we're going to push this further back. Now that I have these different frames in space, it's kind of sparse. I don't necessarily want just these seven picture frames in space. I'd like to fill it with a bit more objects in there. I'm gonna go ahead and open up my finder and just place in the different things that I want in my drop zones. So I have my AV Ultra tutorial, I'm gonna put that in one, put this fire over here, some water, skull, flower, flower, and lake. So now I have all my drop zones. My video is playing through all of them. If I want to kind of populate a few more of these, I could use a replicator, but a replicator is gonna throw a whole bunch of them out there at once and I'm gonna have to maneuver with it quite a bit. Instead, what I can do is clone a specific layer. So let's go ahead and make a new group. And I'm going to call this group clones. And we're going to place that above our main drop zones. And I'm going to go to my frame two, and I'm going to hit the letter K. And what K does is it makes a clone of whatever you have selected. So I had my whole frame two selected. I'm going to call this clone layer frame two clone. And I'm going to put that in the clones layer. I'm going to do the same thing with three through seven. Just select them all and hit K and it's made clones out of every single one of those. So if I rename these, I'm gonna take those different clones, put them in the clone layer, and now that I have them, we're gonna just rearrange these a little bit so we don't have the same exact ones appearing in the same spot. If I wanted to, I can actually make a clone of a clone. So if I hit this six and I wanna put this other skull guy, maybe all the way back here, and I wanna take this water scene on the lake, gonna clone that and we'll put him up here, push him further back. What's the benefit of using clones? Well, if I go to my original here, so this is my drop zone copy two, and this is in my frame four, and you'll notice in my scene, I have one, two, three of them. You know, maybe I'm not too keen on this lake scene. Maybe what I wanna do is get rid of it. Well. If I go to my drop zone and I go to my image and I clear it, that actually clears all the rest of the clones. So this becomes really powerful. I'm gonna undo that here real quick because if I'm making changes to 
just the original, all the rest will follow. So if I wanted to color correct this original one here, so if I go in my filters, my color correction, and add a bit of a hue saturation to my original copy, and if I want to up the saturation of one and even change the hue, you'll notice they're both changing. Additionally, I can take the same hue saturation, right, and go into my clones, and let's pick this clone right here. And I can uh, place that other effect on here. Now I have two different ways to kind of mix and match this. So here's my original that I put the hue and saturation on. And now here's the clone that I'm color correcting in its own way. So I can still give variation, but if I want to do an all over change, that's one way to do it. So it's an extremely powerful kind of tool to let you create lots of things very, very quickly, especially in a situation like this where we're only having seven frames, but we wanna be able to move around them and make it look like there's a whole lot more going on. If I have these 15 different objects here, it looks like a whole lot more than just, you know, the sparse ones that I have. So if I turn this off, you know, really, that's what we've got. Let's go ahead and turn on our clones again, and let's start animating this. I'm gonna close out that other frame so we just have the single one. And I'm gonna go to my camera, and let's just reset its properties. So if I go to my XYZ or its position, we can just reset the parameter and reset the parameter. And so now we're looking at our Title I drop zone. If I just zoom out a bit, we wanna start pretty far out here in space turn on my clones. And if you remember, we have our far plane and our far fade. So if I crank up this far plane and this far fade, as we get closer to them in space, they're gonna become more opaque. And that's exactly what we want. So we're gonna start out pretty far out here. And now let's go to our library and go to our behaviors, camera, and we're gonna go framing and place it on there. Now that we've put our framing behavior on, I'm gonna open it up in the inspector and drop in our frame one. Right now, it's gonna take the entire duration of my project here. That's not what I want. I want it to only take about that long after we fade in. And now we can see that our camera's perfectly framed right onto that frame one. Just like before, we're gonna take our framing offset and we're gonna pull it back just a little bit about 400 pixels. So if I do a RAM preview by hitting Shift Option Command R, we'll just let that preview really quickly so we can take a look at it. And great, so that's sitting exactly where we want it. Let's go ahead and add a second framing behavior. This time, we're just going to duplicate it. So I'm gonna hit my framing and hit Command D, and that's our framing copy. I'm gonna drag it over just a little bit further, right about here or so. And in our framing copy, the first thing I wanna do is I wanna rename this. So I'm just gonna double click it, and we'll call it Frame 2. And the reason why I do that is just so I know exactly what it's framing onto from just looking at it. It can be a little confusing when you have a bunch of different behaviors and you don't know exactly what they're doing. So by giving them some different names, you can know exactly what they're gonna be doing. And now I'm gonna have this going to our frame two and I can see that that is our fire. So in, in this case, I might actually go to my frame two clone. And so if I open up my framing two behavior, we're gonna drag our frame two clone into that. And what this will do is start moving from this point over to that frame. And you can see what happened is it moved in this XY kind of fashion. And instead of focusing on this side, I actually want it to be on the other side. So if I go to my frame two target face, I can hit back Z. And so what this will do is actually flip around my scene from that first frame. So if I open up two views here, we can kind of see what's happening. If I change this to my perspective, take a look at what's happening here. So this is our framing one behavior. And once it moves from here, it moves to here to catch that second frame view. So if I play this back, you can see where that camera is moving to. And now it is behind everything else looking this way. I'm just gonna hit Command D on my frame and move it down over here. Maybe we'll give that one a little bit more time. And I'm gonna go right down the line to my frame three. I've duplicated that framing behavior and I'm just gonna name this one frame three. And let's go ahead and just duplicate the rest. So we're gonna do frame four, five, six, seven. Take my frame three and we're just going to drag another frame into there. And I'm gonna leave it at back Z. Maybe this one, I want just a little bit more further back. And I'm gonna mess with my rotation and my position time as that's gonna create a slightly different kind of animation. And in my transition, I'm gonna change this to ease 
both. And let's do that for the rest of our behaviors. Now that those behaviors are rendered, we can kind of preview these and see what's happening. And I'm just double checking these to make sure they're the way I want them. I'm just extending these, but I'm also being careful not to overlap them. Otherwise, it's still going to be framing and then jumping right into the other frame. So now that I have those, I also want to create a bit of secondary motion. And I'm going to go to my library and we're going to do a bit of a dolly. And I like to add a dolly behavior through my whole animation just to kind of give a little bit of movement. If I change this back to a single screen, open up my dolly behavior, and we're just going to pull that back to about here, and we're going to ease both. So now through the whole animation, while everything is still animating into these different places, we have a bit of this slow pullback the entire time. It adds just a little bit of extra dynamics to my motion so it doesn't feel as static. Another thing that we're going to do is add some different sweeps. So I'm going to go back to my library and we'll add a sweep behavior and we're going to add a few of these. So our first sweep behavior is going to take place from the very beginning to before it moves into frame two. And that's a bit harsh for me right there on that side. We're going to take this to about 12 degrees. And what's interesting about the sweep behavior is that when we add a secondary one, so if I duplicate this and I place this one over here, it's still at that 12 degrees and now it's going to go even further. So in this case, it's almost going to double that up. So it's going to be 12 degrees on top of that 12 degrees. So I might want to take this and start at 12 degrees and end at, let's say, negative 40. So as it kind of moves through, we're creating a bit more dynamic movement. One thing to be careful of with our sweep behaviors is whatever behavior is on top is going to be the one that it's going to use right away. So for example, I've overlapped these two in my timeline and check out what happens on my screen as they overlap it jumps right away into the next behavior's settings and starts animating it that way. So if this was, you know, seven frames, it's going to jump quite a bit. And that may not be the look that we're going for. Be careful that with our sweep behaviors, we're not overlapping them. And we'll add another one here. And this one's just going to take us somewhat back to normal. Negative 40, go to zero. Because of the way the sweep behaviors work, they're almost aggregate. So first it goes from 0 to 12, and then from 12 to negative 40, and now from negative 40 to about 30 degrees, we're kind of undoing what we just kind of put on there. So be aware of that. Sweep can get a little counterintuitive. When in doubt, go to the end of the behavior to make sure that it's going to look the way that you want it to. The last thing that we're going to do here is I could turn on my depth of field, but the trade-off is things are going to render a lot slower. So if I go to my renderer, turn on my depth of field, I'm going to have to make sure that I turn on my perspective and that the objects that I'm framing are actually in my depth of field. So I'll have to open this up, turn on a far focus and set my near focus and my focus offset. And if I go back to my camera view, you'll notice that I have my foreground in focus. Everything else is out of focus. It will take a bit longer to render. So instead, if I don't have to use that, I won't. So instead of using my depth of field to create my blurs in the background, instead, what I want to do is I want to add a variable blur to everything. So if I added a variable blur to my main drop zones right now, check out what happens. If I put this on here, yeah, everything else in the background blurs out except my clone layers. And the reason for that is because this blur is only affecting my main drop zones right now. So I'm going to undo that. And instead, I'm going to put my main drop zones and my clones in their own group. So I'm going to group that. And we're going to call this all screens. And now if I add this variable blur, you can see it's affecting all of my different screens at the same time. And now that I've added this variable blur, Check out what it's doing here. So as I'm kind of moving around, you can see whatever's in the center is in focus. So let's work with this a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and change this outer 
radius. In fact, let's really crank this up so we can see exactly what it's doing. And I can also take our inner radius and set it to something about there. And we're just gonna dial back that amount again just so we get that really nice soft blur in the background. And so this will render a lot faster than if we just used that depth of field. My name is Stanislaw Robert Liberta with AV Ultra, and this has been a quick way to put together an intro title and slideshow using clones and drop zones in 3D space and animating them with a camera. In our next lesson, what we're gonna be taking a look at is publishing different parameters. And what that means is, what if I wanted to put this into Final Cut and be able to just drag and drop different items into these drop zones right from Final Cut and even change out the colors or our backdrop or work with this variable blur. Be sure to check out the next lesson. And as always, hopefully you found this information useful.